Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and take a look at our Bellwork for today. In order for a function to be continuous, we know that the value of the function at any of these, at any of these break even points in the piecewise defined function, right? The value of the function must be equal to the value of the limit as x approaches c for these breakpoint values. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this first one. It looks to me in a piecewise definition, we've got a breakpoint x value at x equals 0. So we want to make sure that the value of the function is equal to the limit of the function as x approaches 0. And so firstly, we can get the value of the function at x equals 0. Which definition will I use, top or bottom? to find the value of the function at x equals 0. Brendan? The top when x equals 0? Yeah. Oh, no, uh, the bottom, sorry. Just because of the or equal to versus the strictly absolutely good. And so I'm going to go ahead and go into that bottom definition, right? As x approaches, I'm sorry, when x equals 0, I evaluate, and it looks like it gives me a, right? Doesn't a minus 2 times 0 equal a? Now I need to consider the limit of the function as x approaches 0. In order to do that, I must consider the, the two-sided limits. That is, the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. They must exist and equal one another for the overall limit to exist. Then that overall limit must equal the value of the function. So quick, we'll do a left-hand limit. So that is the limit as x approaches 0 from the left-hand side. <clears throat> and which function definition will I use to consider that, Riley? Um, or sine x. Great. And as x approaches 0 from the left hand side, 4 sine of x all right, exists and approaches what? 0. So it looks like my left hand limit is that. Now we need a right hand limit. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the right hand side, I'll use the lower definition. Um, and this exists. It looks to me like the right hand limit as x approaches 0. This term drops out, and I get what? A. So for the overall limit to exist, right, I need the left-hand limit to match the right-hand limit. Namely, I need A to equal 0. So if A equals 0, then this should be good. Is that what we're saying? All right, let's do a quick check in my calculator then with A equals 0. So on my home screen, I like storing that in alpha A. <laughs> 0 is such an easy thing, too. But... It's fun to do my calculator commands. you gotta, you got to appreciate the little things, right? So in my piecewise defined function, I'll go ahead and consider my first function, 4 sine of x. And I want, um, I want to do a piecewise defined function. So how do I restrict the domain? Well, in order to do the re domain restriction, happy fingers. In order to do the domain restriction, I'll go ahead and divide any term by quantity, my domain restriction. I want x to be strictly less than 0, so I'll go ahead and do second math as my test menu. Strictly less than is the fifth option, 0, right? And quick check before I go any further, make sure I'm good to go with my mode reading. And it should stop if I've entered that correctly. How do we do? So far so good. Great. Let's add our second function definition. And we want a to be 0, so that's just minus 2x. Well, that's not bad then. And we want that to apply when x is greater than or equal to 0. So I'll divide by quantity, x domain restriction. Second math is the test. Second, uh, second math is the test I want it greater than or equal to. So the fourth option. Great. I think we're going to get it. And I've got the red line style already. And if I zoom to enter, that might be pretty sweet. Is it going to do it? So here it comes. And same place. We don't have to. We don't have to lift my pen or pencil tip as we as we approach that. So it looks like a equals zero. Raise your hand if you already had that a long time ago. A equals zero. Just visually, does it look like this function is differentiable at x equals zero? Right? Does it look like this function is differentiable? Sophia? No. No, how come? Yeah, we've got the left-hand slope not matching the right-hand slope, right? If those values exist are in our finite, however, right, then we call it, we'll call that a corner. If the left-hand slope exists but doesn't match the right-hand slope, then that's a corner. And it certainly, right, certainly is not differential. Good. Let's take a look at our next one. In this case, we've got a 
three p function. We want our function to be continuous for all real x. So what are we going to do? Well, we've got to consider two different two different breakpoints this time. So let's go ahead and consider my value of my function at the first base point. Looks like x equals negative one. And the value of my function at x equals negative one. Uh oh, this isn't going to work. What am I missing? I'm missing an or equal to. We need an or equal to to make this happen, right? Because Regardless of what we do, right? The function is not defined. So, which one do we want? We'll go ahead and take the left one. How's that? Better? Otherwise, not possible. Did you guys stop when you saw that and then yeah. does not exist? <laughs> Let's pretend that that was our equal to. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, as x goes to negative 1, right? If x equals negative 1, we'll use the top definition. 5 plus 3 times negative 1 is 2. Thank goodness. The limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left-hand side right, is the same definition. 5 plus 3x. That exists. n equals 2. Hey, that's good news. Sorry, it's the second limit. X approaches negative one from the right. I'll use ax plus b definition. Negative one is in the domain of my expression, so I'll get negative a plus b. Is that right? Awesome. So what do we need? We need negative a plus b to equal what two? We're good. Yes. Awesome. Second break even point. F of 3. So let's see what that is. F of 3, I'll use the bottom definition. 7 minus 3 squared is 9, right? So 7 minus 9, is that right? Is negative 2? You guys getting that? Negative 2? All right, so now what do we need to do? Oh gosh, we've got to do the limit as x approaches 3 from the left hand side. We'll go ahead and use that ax plus b definition for that. 3 is in the domain of this expression, so I get 3a plus b. Yes? Right hand limit. As x approaches 3 from the right, I'll use my lower definition, 7 minus x squared. 3 is in the domain of that expression, 3 squared and uh, negative 2 again. Yes? So we've generated two equations. Our first equation, negative a plus b must equal 2. Our second equation, ax plus, uh, sorry, 3a plus b must equal negative 2. I now have a system of two equations, two unknowns. We're well equipped to solve whatever we need to do. So how do you guys want to solve this? Substitution. Linear combinations slash addition method slash elimination. Don't care. Substitution. All right, so we'll make the first one. I mean, elimination is my favorite, but whatever. So, yeah, elimination is you just subtract the top from the bottom or whatever. Let's do that. Elimination? Yes. All right, uh, that's a fun one. That's what I love to hear in math class. That's a fun one. That's a fun one. Rewrite the bottom. Subtract the second one. A minus B equals negative 2. So I took opposite. I took opposite of that top one. And I got A minus B equals negative 2. And now we can go ahead and add the two together. I'm getting 4A equals negative 4 which means that a equals negative 1, which means that b equals negative a negative 1. What? Negative a negative 1 is 1 plus b equals 2, so b equals positive 1. Is that right? So I'm getting a equals negative 1 and b equals 1. Raise your hand if you got the same thing. You get the same thing? Oh, gosh. Let's do a quick check. I better grab this though before we go any farther. All right. Let's do a quick check. So we want 5 plus 3x, oh gosh, divided by x less than or equal to, uh-oh, I'm going to go 
back. Less than or equal to negative one. Good catch. Uh oh. And AX plus B is going to be negative X plus 1. Is that right? Negative X plus 1. And domain restriction divided by quantity. Negative 1 is, oh, this is the one where we have to do our double. So negative 1 is less than, oh goodness, 5X. And then we need our logic. And what's the other one? X is less than 3. We can do that. X is less than 3. We get everybody. And 7 minus X squared. Thank goodness. We're almost there. Feel it. And greater than or equal to. So 4 and 3. All right. Did we get it all? I hope so. So let's go ahead and window up. I need negative one, three in my gearing window, so that's pretty good. Maybe I'll go to five. And we need negative two and negative two, so maybe I'll go negative five to negative five and see what happens. Without further ado, let's sit back and let the calculator do the magic. And by golly, looks like Math Woman would not have to take a jump. Hey! All right, connected, continuous, connected to the value of the function is equal to the value of the limit at each of my breakpoints. Awesome. What questions do you guys have about our bell work today? As I wade through my town all severe cough, cold, and congestion. Okay. <laughs> You're wondering, spirit seems a little bit off today. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. It's going to be okay, though. So let's take care of our two checks, and I'll pause the recording. There. Okay, thank you for your help with your assignments, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and take a step back. We want to make sure that we're comfortable with our continuity versus differentiability discussion from way back before fall break. So what must be true for a function f of x to be continuous at x equals c? And I give you a hint. This great big equal sign here, right? So for a function to be continuous at x equals c, let's use f's and x's and c's. And what would that look like for an equation? Any? Um... The limit of f of x is x of has to equal uh, f of c. Yes, very nice. That's good. Let's add our differentiability now. A function fails to be differentiable at x equals c if any of the following occur at x equals c. And so, what's going to mess it up? Well, number two from Bellwark before I saw the or equal to versus the strictly that would mess up differentiability if there's no place to hang the tangent line. If the function is not continuous, right? So any type of discontinuity. Fails to be differentiable. A curved x equals any a discontinuity. So if there's a discontinuity at x equals c, then there's no way my function can be differentiable. Types of discontinuities include everything from AB. So you've got your um, your infinite discontinuity or vertical asymptote. You've got your step or jump discontinuity. And then you've got your, um, which is the other kind, are removable. Uh -oh. Where the overall limit exists, but we don't have the full plug at x equals c. A function can still be continuous and not differentiable like number one from the belt. What happened there? Well, we had a corner. We had a corner where the left-hand slope existed, the right-hand slope existed, but there were different values. So when the right-hand slope exists, the left-hand slope exists, but there are different values, and we've got a corner. And lastly, we now have our cusp definition is where the limit is infinite on one side and the other. Yes? Aren't there the discontinuous functions that are differentiable? Like, aren't there some that go like that and that? Saying? Yes. Aren't those so, like a, a rational function that has a vertical asymptote? Yeah. Yeah. At x equals c, right? At x equals c, 
the function is discontinuous. So there'd be no place to put a tangent line, right? It wouldn't be locally linear if you zoomed in at x equals c. On one side, our function values are approaching infinity. On the other side, our function values are approaching negative infinity. And the function does not exist at x equals c. So there's no place to hang our tangent line. For those x values, right, for those x values to the left of x equals c, yes, we could zoom in and it would be local, locally linear. Right, but those function values would be the the slopes of the that uh, uh, on the left hand side would be approaching infinity. The slopes on the right hand side would be approaching oh, negative infinity, infinity, and those are different. So it's not all x is different at x equals c. Yes. Okay. Now, for any value within the domain of that hyperbola, right, then the function is differentiable. Right. So you could look anywhere else along. So yes, it's differentiable for everywhere else except at x equals c, and that's what the point of this is. Right. Cool, no problem. What's the cut? When your slope values are, become infinite, right? Opposite infinity on either side, but the function is still continuous. And so here my left, whoa. From the, special, <laughs> from the left hand side, right, my slopes become infinite. On the right hand side, my slopes are uh, approaching negative infinity. This is right, not differentiable, even though it's continuous. Awesome. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at our quick and dirty intermediate value theorem review for the first part, and then we're going to compare some relative growth rates of functions, right? Which is going to build on what we've already dealt with with L'Hopital's rule in indeterminate forms. We know that if a function is continuous throughout some interval a to b, and we have a particular y value, call it y equals k here in green. This in between the y coordinates of my endpoints, f of a, a and f of b, then guarantee there must be right, some x equals c value in between a and b where the value of my function in blue right, takes on the value of my y value in green, the y equals k. And we saw that in context last year with our, uh, our daily temperature as a function of time. Right? If my low in the morning was 53 and my high in the afternoon was 74, we know that if y equals 63 degrees, sometime during the day, our daily temperature had to hit that, that, that y equals um, 63 degrees in order to get from one place to the next. All right, so if f is a function that's continuous over the interval a to b, and m is some y value in between a and f at a and f at b, then there exists a number c between a and b such that f of c equals m, and we saw the visual representation. We're not going to do these first couple problems. I just want to set you up. There's two homework problems in your assignment tonight where you'll have to generate an equation, show that the function is continuous. Which, and that the y value of concern is in between the endpoint y values, which will allow us to apply the intermediate value theorem. And then you're going to just use your old methods of solving the equation in order to solve. In this case, we're trying to show that there's some number c between 2 and 3, where f of c equals 7. That is, x squared, right? My function x squared equals 7. Well, let's see the function on the interval 2 and 3 f of 2 equals 4, f of 3 equals 9. Is my y value of concern in between 4 and 9? Yes. Is my function f of x equals x squared continuous? Yes. I satisfy the two prerequisites for the mean, I'm sorry, the intermediate value theorem to apply. Therefore, I can set up an equation. In this case, x squared equals 7, right? And solve to figure out the value of the that occurs. Sometimes there'll be two, sometimes there'll be one. If I were to solve x squared equals seven, I'd produce two values, x equals positive root seven and x equals negative root seven. However, because we were asked about on the interval two to three, only one of them applies when we pick that. All right, so x the polynomial is therefore continuous and y equals seven is in between f of two equals four and f of three equals nine, therefore the intermediate value is going to apply. Same with this case. Use the intermediate value theorem to prove that the cube root of 50 exists and is greater than 3 and less than 4. In this case, we would choose the cubing function as my polynomial. We consider my endpoint y coordinates, f of 3, f of 4. f of 3 is 27. f of 4 is 64, right? <coughs> is 50 in between 27 and 64? Yes. Is f of x equals x cubed continuous? Yes, again, I've satisfied my two requirements for the intermediate value theorem to apply. 
and I can now write an equation. So since f is continuous and 50 is in between 20s and uh, 64, I can set up an equation, in this case x cubed, and I want that to equal 50, and then solve it. Dot, dot, dot. To apply the mean va intermediate value theorem, rather, you must satisfy the two prerequisites and state them. Okay? And so because f is a polynomial and continuous, and my y value considered 50 was in between f of 3 equals 27 and f of 4 equals 64, the intermediate value theorem applies. Where can we run into problems? Well, let's consider this. Show that the equation has a root on the given interval. 2x cubed minus 6x plus 1 equals 0 on the interval 1 to 2. In this case, we have a polynomial. Therefore, f is continuous, right? So we've got one requirement. Next, we must consider the endpoint values. f at 1 is negative 3. f at 2 is 5. Is a root. What, what's a root? Xylem, phloem. Gosh, <laughs> I'm hard for that, honestly. No, not that kind of root, right? What what are we talking about graphically here? What are we referring to as a root? Don't remember? Sydney? I don't know. Say it. Is it an x intercept? Yeah, an x intercept. <laughs> an x intercept for the graph, a zero of the function, is a root to the equation set equal to zero. Absolutely. Right? And so root is synonymous with solution or x intercept of the graph graphically if it's real. If it's a real root, we can see it as an x intercept. Good. All right. So we'll go ahead and say that our y coordinate zero is between the endpoint y values, negative three. This should be negative three. Is that going to show up? And five. Right? Zero is between negative three and five. Therefore, the intermediate value theorem applies, and we can now solve that equation. Now, we, in order to solve that, could use a variety of different things. Right? I can solve graphically. I can solve numerically using my graphing calculator if it's calculator allowed. Otherwise, I'd have to solve by what, like factoring, and so on and so forth, rational roots theorem, synthetic division, so all that if it was non-calculator. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and do one then. Use the intermediate value theorem, if applicable, to show that f has a root up on the interval 1 to 2. So what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to consider my endpoint y coordinates and my original function. We need continuity, and we need our y value of concern to be in between f at a and f at b. So we'll get my y values. f at 1 equals 1 to the 4th plus 1 is 2 minus 3 to the negative 1. F at 2 is my y coordinate at the right end point. So that would be 2 to the 4th is 16, plus 2 is 18, minus 3 is 15. Is that what you guys are getting? Awesome. And since f is a polynomial, and continuous, and y equals 0 is between negative 1 and 15. The intermediate value theorem applies. value theorem states for continuous f <coughs> with y value concerned in between my endpoints f at a and f at b, I can find some x equals c value where f of x is equal to, right, is that equal to my y value of concern. So what am I going to do? I have to write my equation. In this case, I want my equation x to the fourth plus x minus three. I want that to equal zero. We've got all kinds of ways that we can solve this, but it doesn't look good for factoring. So I think I'm going to go numerically for this one. We can go ahead and enter my original function, my y equals, after I clear out all that piecewise business. My original is x to the fourth <coughs> plus x minus 3 
right? And we want our window of one to two. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my window and restrict it. For my window, I'm gonna go negative one, two, four. So what did you guys see? Is that on my interval? <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. So we can do a second. Calculate and what we want. We want zero. And left bound, remember, go to the left side of where you think the feature occurs. Right bound to the right side of where you think the feature occurs. And guess. Voila! It looks like about 1.164 reminder of AB curriculum. Right? And BC curriculum, we want to keep three decimal places. So we'd say that x equals approximately 1.164. That's pretty sweet. OK. Use the intermediate value theorem if applicable to show that f has root of 1 to 2. Same thing. Let's jump to this one. So you guys have uh, f of x equals x plus 1 over x squared minus 4. Show that f has a root on 0 to 5, right? On 0 to 5. And so what do we need to consider? We've got to consider f of 0. We've got to consider f of 5. And we want to make sure that y equals 0 is in between those endpoint y coordinates. So here we go. f of 0 equals 1 over negative 4, I mean, negative 1 fourth. Yes? f of 5 is 6 over 25 minus 4 is 21 is 5. 21st, yes? Is y equals 0 in between negative 1 fourth and 521st? Yes! So we should be able to figure out. Six. Sorry, 6. 6 21st. Yeah. Good. Next. Now I've got to reduce though. Yikes. 6 21st divided by 3 divided by 3, so 2 sevenths. How's that? Is that better? Mm -hmm. We're all point 0.14. Two eight five six. Wow. All right, ready? Go. Well, what's going on here? If I enter my original function x plus one, oh boy. Divided by quantity x squared minus four. Zero to five. So negative one to seven. So in between zero and five, do I have uh, an x-intercept? So what the, what went wrong here? Is there an x equals c value? No. Such that y equals zero? No. no. How come? It's not continuous on an interval of concern. We can see from my original function definition that my x squared minus 4 causes domain problems, right? At x equals plus or minus 2. So because my function is undefined on the interval 0 to 5 at x equals 2, we've got a discontinuity, right? So we may or may not be able to apply the intermediate value theorem. In this case, we can see graphically that the intermediate value theorem does not apply. Since f is discontinuous on 0 to 5, the intermediate value theorem does not apply. So that's what we have to be on the lookout for. We need both prerequisites to occur, not just one of them. All right. And the rest of that is good. All right. What I'd like to do then is take a look and switch gears as we move towards something new, and that's comparing relative growth rates. And we've tiptoed around this in the AB curriculum. And again, this year, with L'Hopital's rule, as we extended our, our discussion to include some more indeterminate forms. Guys, consider these following functions. I want you to use limit notation to describe the right end behavior of each. And so you can think about this graphically, right? What does f of x equal e to the x 
how does that behave as you look to the right end behavior? That is, as x approaches infinity. Contrast that with the right end behavior of g. A little bit of g of x, that is, in this case, x to the fifth, as x approaches infinity. And finally, <coughs> the limit is x approaches infinity of L of x. All right, so what did you and your partner get for the right end behavior of E to the x, right? What does that do? What does that do? Kobe? Uh, it goes to infinity. All right, we know graphically our E to the x function, right? Our E to the x function. Increases without bound as x increases without bound. What about x to the fifth? So what did that do? Grace? Um, it, also it also goes to infinity. In this case, we're dealing with a power function model. x to the fifth is an odd power function, so we've got our discordant behavior. We've got our down, up. <laughs> and lastly, what does ln of x do as x goes to infinity? Danny? Uh, it goes to infinity. It goes to infinity as well. So here we've got one, two, three different cases. As x increases without bound, my function values also increase without bound. A more interesting question is, as x increases without bound, what happens to the function values? They all go to infinity, but who grows faster? Right? Who grows faster? So for this, it's not enough to rely on my haphazardly drawn, though pretty color-coded, graphical representations by hand, right? We can now consider growth rates, relative growth rates. And when you hear rate of growth, you should be thinking one key word that starts with D from your AP calculus curriculum, right? We're thinking derivatives. Our derivative was a quantitative measure of how quickly something grows. So as you compare the derivatives of these functions, maybe we'll gain some insight into who grows more quickly, well, what you might already interpret intuitively. So what do we have? We had blue e to the x. We had green x to the fifth. Is that right? We had red l of x. All right. So let's get our derivative machine involved here. What then is f prime for our blue function? What's f prime for our blue function? Marissa? E to the x. E to the x. What's our f prime for our green function? Our green function, Sydney? 5x plus 4. And what's our h prime then, Kylie? Well, two of these certainly help, but as x goes to infinity, now I can consider what's happening to my growth rate by considering a new limit. Now we're doing a limit of h prime, right? That would be the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x. What happens to this expression as x goes to infinity? Ah. This goes to zero. This exists in equals zero. So I see that my relative growth, I'm sorry, my growth rate of ln of x is approaching zero in the long run versus my growth rate of my blue e to the x function is approaching infinity. So clearly, these grow more quickly. e to the x grows more quickly than ln of x. I'm going to put equals zero here. What about this middle one, though? Okay. As x approaches infinity, what does g prime of do? g prime of x do? It goes to infinity as well. And so here we're stuck in a situation, right, where we've got two limits of growth rates that are approaching infinity. So what do I do? Quit? Give up? That is, their growth rates are both approaching infinity. Who wins? 
Well, we could consider the rate of change in the growth rate by taking F double prime and G double prime, right? And when we did so, what would we get for F double prime? In the X, and what would we get for G double prime? 20x to the third, and we'd still get infinity and so on and so forth. But you would see a light at the end of the tunnel if we were to continue to differentiate, right? We would eventually arrive at a constant, whereas this exponential would continue kicking out e to the x's, e to the x's, e to the x's, and so this would always stay infinity, right? An infinite for its growth rate. This one would eventually level off if you consider the rates of change on the growth rates. All right, there's a much easier way. Let's consider the quotient of the quotient of my function f of x over g of x or g of x over f of x. Our L'Hopital's rule we recognize would right would be applicable as x goes to infinity. We get infinity over infinity, and we can differentiate top and bottom in accordance with L'Hopital's rule until we arrive at either an infinite or a zero limit. So we can compare growth rates of growth. F grows faster than G, and equivalently, G grows slower than F as X approaches infinity if the limit as X approaches infinity of F of X over G is infinity, or equivalently, the reciprocal G of X over F of X, the limit as X approaches infinity equals zero. F and G grow at the same rate as X approaches infinity if the limit of their quotient equals some non-zero constant, call it L. Doesn't matter if that constant is positive or negative, right? Negative one fourth or positive two thirds. If it equals some constant, then we say that they grow at the same rate as x increases without bound. Did you guys get this on your slide? Yeah. Awesome. Let's go ahead and try some. So uh, this is our final our our final um, skill added on to your concept and skill guidance. So let's see if we can consider the relative growth rates here. Arrange the function families in order of increasing growth rate as x approaches infinity. And we can do this informally now by using all we know about function families. And so I already saw some primes when we were considering growth rates. So I want you to go ahead and take a minute with your, um, with your partner and arrange these in increasing order. So the slowest growth up until the fastest growth, okay? And this is not on your sheet. I just wanted you to arrange these then. And I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and then I'm going to have you share. Okay, time's up, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and share your increasing order of relative rates of growth. So what did you have for your slowest growing? Your slowest growing, what did you guys have for that? Vivian and Riley? H of X. H of X, followed by increasing rate of L of X. L of X. I'm not saying right or wrong, I'm just going to go ahead. Followed by G of X. Followed by, then there's one to go. So we've said logarithmic, linear, power function for, I assume, positive, right? Positive integer and exponent, and <coughs> exponential. Raise your hand if you have the same ranking. The same ranking? You are absolutely correct. Graphically, if you consider these functions, right? If you consider these functions and you look to the far end behavior, rates of growth, you can verify what the derivatives. But my H and B, that we saw, my L of X, that. My x to the n. And, oh, maybe I better do something like this. This is my x to the n. There we go. And my exponential. There we go. So we can, again, haphazardly draw Mr. Fritz with the color code, but not very straight. We've got our functions there. I always also want to make sure that we've got exponential would be that. Power would be that, linear would be that, and logarithm would be that. You can use this when, right, when you're considering our quotients, you can use the fact that exponentials are the fastest growing functions if x is going to infinity, and so on and so forth. And that would be helpful. All right, so as x approaches infinity, does one function grow faster and one slower, or do they grow at the same rate? Well, we already have an intuitive understanding of these, and we've seen them in the past. Let's just go ahead and verify using our comparison test though. So we consider the limit as x approaches infinity. And I'll go ahead and put my exponential to the x. Uh-oh, that looks like 2x. I want 2 to the x. 
over, and I'll do my power function, x squared on bottom. Do you have a gut sense of which one is going to go faster and which one's going to go slower? Yes, we just ranked in order, right? Which one do we expect to go faster here? Courtney? Um, the top. Yeah, this top, 2 to the x. g of x is an exponential function versus f is a power function. We know exponential wins out in the long run as long as we're looking at x sufficiently large. So how can we verify that using our test algebraically? Well, as x goes to infinity, we get <coughs> the infinity over infinity. Yes, we get infinity over infinity. Well, that just so happens to be an indeterminate form that authorizes these Lopital's rule. So we could apply Lopital's rule if we're trying to evaluate this out break. That is the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. And try, try again. As I do that, I notice my top, 2 to the x, times ln 2 is still infinite as x grows towards infinity. And my bottom is also infinite. But now I have an exponential over a linear function. And we're getting closer to my ranking. It's even becoming more apparent, right, who's going to win out in this struggle. And yet, I can do open calls a little more time for the algebraic verification. On top, this becomes the exponential itself times the natural log of the base times the constant multiplier. Now I'm getting ln squared, right, of 2 all over 2. And finally, the end is in sight. I know my top is approaching infinity. My denominator is a constant. I know that this is not indeterminate, right? I can determine the value of this limit just by looking at it. This is infinite. And so I see that if the limit of the quotient of my functions goes to infinity, then the numerator function, in this case we use g, grows faster. And we saw that with our test. So we had this situation. As x went to infinity, we generated an infinite limit. That means the numerator function, the numerator function grew faster. The name of the function, g, here doesn't matter. The numerator function grows more quickly. Therefore, g grows more quickly as x gets infinitely large. Well, we knew that, right? Don't we know that an exponential function goes faster than a power? Let's consider a different pairing. Let's consider e to the x times, and now I made a combination function, x times the element of x, a product of two functions. And while intuitively we saw e to the x grows faster than both x and ln x, what if we combine them into a new function that there's their product and consider the relative growth rates now as x gets infinitely large? Again, we'll go ahead and set up a, a quotient and apply my comparison test. As x approaches infinity, right, I could do either e to the x over or I could do x ln x over. I'm going to do. Okay. I'll do x on the x over dx. As x goes to infinity, what is my numerator? My numerator approach. Well, it looks like I've got infinity times infinity is infinity squared. I'm just kidding. Can't do that. <laughs> is infinite. And e to the infinitely large x is also infinite. So I've got an indeterminate form that authorizes these to be calls. If I'm invalidating this algebraically, we can go ahead and apply a little bit also and try try again. But on top, I have to use what differentiation rule? Right? What differentiation rule do I have to apply on top? Maybe in, yeah, the product rule. The derivative of a product of two functions is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So I've still got to do that. And that's all over the derivative of the bottom, e the x. I think that's sticking around for the party. The exponential function. X times 1 over X. Is that just 1? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, now we've got to our comparative functions. We see this ln of X is going to be unaffected by the plus 1 as X gets infinitely large. And so I'm banking on this e to the X growing more quickly right, than this natural log function, whereas before I couldn't necessarily tell the product. However, because I still have an infinite form, if I wanted to show that out of the break, I have to apply what we call rule one more time and consider the derivative of ln of x all over the derivative of e to the x. Now I see I no longer have an indeterminate form. 
That is, as x approaches infinity, 1 over x e to the x approaches 1 over <coughs> an infinite product. Is this indeterminate? Is this indeterminate? No, this is certainly determinate. Constant over a quantity approaching infinity exists and it equals what? Zero. So we've got a situation where the quotient, right, the limit of the quotient of functions x approaches infinity equals zero. Therefore, which one grew faster? That denominator function. The denominator function. So what do we say? Can we do a so? So, which one was it this time? Was the denominator? Oh, yes. So f of x goes faster. All right, guys. One to go. As x approaches infinity, does one function go faster or one slower at the same rate? So I tried to pick ones, right, where we could intuitively see, based on our comparative growth rates of our function families, we could kind of pick a winner. What about this guy? f of x equals 3 root x minus 5 quantity squared versus g of x equals 4x. Right? Can we tell based on our function family sort from earlier which one grows faster just by looking? They're both algebraic functions here, aren't they? One's not exponential, one's not logarithmic, right? The way it's easy to tell. One's not straight power with the other one not. So it's more difficult to see, right? So this is a situation where my, my comparison test, the limit is x approaching infinity of the quotient of the two functions, is going to be more useful. And I can determine which one I'd like to have on top or which one I'd like to have on bottom. I'll consider the limit is x approaches infinity. And which one do you guys want to have on top? 4x. 4x? Over 3 root x minus 5? 20 squared? Okay. So as x goes to infinity, what does the top do? Infinity. That goes to infinity. And the denominator? Do you know what that looks like? Yeah, that's still the thing. Yeah, I had to do my function calc, then it's just to remind myself. So, want to try Logan Tell's rule? Yeah. Yes, she? Okay, let's do Logan Tell's rule. So, the limit as x approaches infinity of 4 over, oh goodness. So, how are we going to differentiate that bottom expression? Well, that's a great review for our test. I'm going to use the pow, pow, power rule with the chain. <laughs> Exponent, <laughs> right, times the base, raised to one less, times over the base. Where my base is 3 root x minus 5, all to the first power, and now times the derivative of my base. What's the derivative of 3 root x minus 5? That would be. 3 over 2 root x. So I'm not doing what we rule in this step. I'm simply going to rewrite this expression, right? So it's simplified. It looks like I've got 4, and then I've got 2 times root 3. No, sorry, 3 root x. All right, all right, all right. 3 root x minus 5, close quantity, times 3 over 2 root x. So that would be times 3 divided by 2 root x would be times 2 root x. Right? This 3 over 2 root x is 3 over 2 root x. Which, can we do it one more time? Equals the limit as x approaches infinity of, and the twos cancel. That's good, but not much else. So I get 4 root x over 3 times quantity. Well, can we just do it? 
Niner X minus 13. Yes? Okay. As X approaches infinity, what's the value of this quotient? Well, the top approach is twice. Bottom approach is So what are we going to do? Um, two. What do we call it? And the top gives me 4 over 2 root x. And the bottom gives me 9 over 2 root x. Right? Minus 13 differentiates to 0. Yes? And what does this equal? I know. Well, the next person is okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, are we going to continue to get root x terms forever and ever and ever if we keep differentiating? Oh. Yes. So we've got a couple of things working for us. As we're evaluating a limit here, and as x approaches infinity, right, this root x or root x isn't a particular value, right? And so, so we've got to either skirt around the fact that this root x and this root x, now since they're the same, the same function, they must go at the same rate and just focus in on the constants and get four ninths, which would equal a constant to ensure the same rate, right? All, or alternatively, if we had chosen to put f on top, we could have algebraically simplified this without using what we call the rule at all by rewriting this 4x as a radical. <laughs> and, that's, and that's okay. Right? And that's okay. And so if we want to, if we want to group this algebraically like this to finish out this student's approach, <laughs> I'm going to do it like this. <laughs> By writing this like this, would you agree that root x over root x, right? These two functions are going to go <coughs> at the same rate as x gets infinitely large because they're the same function. And we've shown that the limit as x approaches infinity of the quotient of functions is equal to a non zero constant. Therefore, f and g go at the same rate. Applying this logic, it turns out that it turns out that x and 1x grow at the same rate as x gets infinitely large. What? f of x equals 2x is a slant line with slope 2 forever. g of x equals x is a slant line with slope 1 forever. How in the world could these grow at the same rate as x gets infinitely large? Oh, as x gets infinitely large, both of these are linear functions, right? x to the first, x to the first. Comparatively, as x gets infinitely large, according to this definition, these two functions grow at the same rate. That is, exponential versus linear versus logarithmic, right? These actually grow at the same rate, which is something, right, it takes a little bit of getting used to, right? Because we, we don't think of these as growing at the same rate. But they grow at the same rate as x gets infinitely large. And you consider this right, by setting up a quotient of those two functions, evaluating the resulting limit, and you'd see that it would equal a non-zero constant. All right, I just want to throw that in there for good measure and food for thought. Let's close it up for the day. So what are prerequisites for the intermediate value theorem to apply to rate of share? I wanted to provide a template to make sure that if you're applying the intermediate value theorem on your test, that you made sure 
<laughs> Bless you. The prerequisites are satisfied. Is x increases without bound, f grows faster than g if, and we've got two different statements for that. And finally, f and g grow at the same rate if what's true. So a written response for each. Blanks. Let's do the prerequisites for the intermediate value theorem to apply. So, what must we've got two? What prerequisites must right be met in order to apply the intermediate value theorem for a function on an interval a to b? So, what do we need, Marissa? Um, Good job. And my y value concern has to be in between the y coordinates f and a. And uh, f and b, my endpoints of the interval, so my y value is going to have to be between. Good job. So, what I was going for in number two, if f of x is continuous on an interval a to b, and Y equals K or C is between F A and F A B. Then there exists on X equals C value between A and B such that F of Equals y or k. We're going to do y. We're going to do k. <laughs> that was fun. Let's do our comparison test. So as x grow increases without bound, f grows faster than g. If either of two statements are are true, so what's one statement? Vivian. You guys are awesome. We've got a, a spam. I'm going to go ahead and save this. Cool.